Hello. Hey, how are you? Doing well, you? Oh, not too bad. What's going on? Oh, just trying to get all this stuff set up so we can have the meeting. Oh, you're doing fine. All right, running away. But I'll be back. Bye-bye. Your picture and audio is live, by the way. It's just the way I want it, David. Perfect. Thank you. Just a friendly reminder. I appreciate that. So the electronic packet, I don't see any problems with it the way you sent it, other than I didn't see any tabs to click on. It was all just one. You know, you scroll through the pages. It may uh, depend on what version of Adobe you're using. Yeah. Um, some it's very evident and others you have to kind of search for a bookmark and then kind of get a tab on the left-hand side of the page. Yeah. But. Well, I just, um, I'm looking at it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not seeing anything to the left-hand side of the page at all. Um, and I'm scrolling down through and like you said, now what I did is I downloaded it first because my computer recommends that. Yeah. Um, and then I click on the download and bring that up. Um, but it doesn't seem to change it any. Let me see if I can pull it up on my screen. But if you say you're going to change it into a PDF file, that'll that'll change everything I'm looking at, which would be good. Well, it's already in a PDF file, but I was going to change the, the how it was made in PDF. Okay. Oh, see, are, you look, are you looking at it like Chrome or something? Um, yeah, I guess I am. Maybe I should, uh, let me, let me back out of this. Wait, wait, wait. Um, back right out of the email completely. 
and I will go to Safari, that may be the difference right there. You know what I mean? What, what were you looking at it in before? It was in Chrome. Well, I probably can tell you where it would be in Chrome. Well, you hold on. All I'm right. already backed out of it, so. All right. Let me just see what's going on here. Just need 15 different ways to do a computer programmer. Yeah, is what it is. We'll get that. It's still new. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good. All right. Um, meeting packet right there. Uh, it it brings it up different. It brings it up with a big, uh, a big display in the f in the very middle of the page, and then each each individual page is off to the left hand side. So, uh, All right, but, but somewhere there, there's you've got to be able to pull up a table of contents. Oh, really? Yeah, you should be able to. I mean, I'm look. i I just went to the town's website and clicked on it and it opened up and I don't know what, what I'm in edge or something but um, hmm. do you have any type of um, oh, task bar or anything at the top I do because in what I'm looking at has it looks like, uh, I don't know, three or four, like kind of like an outline box in the upper left-hand corner. Yeah. Click on that. Well, that's, uh, to me, it says uh, view. Uh, I, you hide slide bar, thumbnails, table of contents, highlights and notes. Click on table of contents. Oh, there you go. That lists it all. And then you should just be able to click on, you know, number oh, five mi minutes oh, and it should, should jump right there. What do you mean you didn't, you don't know anything about, you know, plenty. No, no this is, oh, that works good. Okay. Thank you, David. Yeah. That, that works good. And so the, the biggest challenge is the fact that we're going to have five, six, five or six, seven of us on, on the screen. And then I still got to view this thing. So that's going to be tough. I, I don't want to be looking at everybody, but I got to have that somewhere. Yeah. It's just tough. Okay. So I've actually, all right, I got it. We're yeah. good. I got Ultim both of them on the screen. I yeah. look at myself. Ultimately when we get to, um, why can't no. I see you? Because I haven't turned my camera on. Uh, okay. Sorry. Ultimately, when we get to having whatever device we might look at for selectmen. Yeah. You know, if we were meeting together and you had your device in front of you, you could pull that packet up and click on it. You wouldn't have to have the camera to do the Zoom plus. Exactly. You know, it's we're trying to do um a lot in what's in my mind a tough time to try to do yeah a lot, a lot of new and different things and all the pieces haven't come together yet but give it time we'll get there no this this actually i think will work pretty good yeah um no i like it well and i i wasn't completely satisfied with um with some of the quality of this stuff, particularly things that are, that are or were in color mm -hmm. until we photocopied them and then scanned them. And then, you know, you get the scanned version. And I think once again, with just a little bit more time and learning curve on this, yeah. we can take these things that come to us electronically and piece those together with things that we have to scan. Exactly. And then, and then put the 
bookmarks on it. So you got the table of contents and then you'll be able to get a better packet. But uh, first time that, out, I think, I think we did okay. No, no, I, I do too. And, and, you know, something to what you were just talking about, that's where it's really going to come in handy. I think we'll be able to add those things to it. Yep. Boy, that well, the other, the other thing that uh, Selectman Gerritsen pointed out um, is if we do it the second way versus the scan way, it can also be searchable. Yeah. So somebody could type in, you know, Dave Guinea, it go and they'd find every every reference. Right now, with it just being scanned, I don't think unless you've got some fancy computer, yeah, fancy program, that's probably not going to happen. Yep. I'm going to silence myself and walk down the hall and grab couple pieces of paper that I should have that I don't. Sure, no problem. Just say not all lonely. <laughs> well, I appreciate you considering me.
Wow, that picture looks like uh, from my angle, moonrise over Midco solid waste. And the reflection well, of light in it. It's amazing how that looks just like that. That was thoughtful of Mike to do that. I had to put a picture of myself up there. So. You should. Halo. I dare you. I like my <laughs> job. I like my job, thanks. No, I don't think that's a life-altering thing. It'd just be kind of funny and something to talk about. That way people would stop talking about me. I could change it up. Yeah. <laughs> what is that? Oh, no. Look, I can make the sunset or yeah. rise. Sun is rising over those solid waste over the upper quarry. Well, at this rate, I think we're going to have some sand left over for next year. Well, I guess I'm not going to complain, except I'm, for you snowmobilers. Yeah, I'm probably going to have to put things on a trailer and head up north. My son is just, my God, we got all this, we got all this equipment. We haven't used it. We've been fishing numerous times, which has been a good time, but he wants yep. to use his snowmobile. So I guess I'm going to have to take him north. If you're going to do it this winter, I think you are. We, I, yeah. Somehow I think we're just going to pay for this in like April. Oh, I think you're right. But it doesn't last long in April, though. So, no. But I, I think you're, I think you're spot on with that. It'll hit when nobody's expects expecting it. He's a historical society had a successful supper there. Did you see that? On the... I read about that today. Yeah. Sounded quite positive. They they're doing a great job. That's good. Maybe a short meeting if it's just you and I, because there's I no, think you're right. It's not a quorum. <clears throat> um, I'm gonna mute myself again and run. All right. Hey Mike. Hey, Kurt, how are we doing? Good, my friend. How are you? I'm doing well. Staying warm. Good for you. Yeah. yeah. Good evening, everyone. Hey, Laidley. Laidley, how are we doing? Not too shabby. How are you guys? Doing well. It's like, yeah. Hey, Josh. Hi, everyone. How's it going? Josh. Good. How are you, Josh? Good. 
Josh, did you see that right up in the people who are looking to take over Fiberite? Uh, yeah, is it a Pennsylvania company? Yes, it is. I'm interested to see what their plans for the future are once they're up and running. They're up and running for new style uh, disposal. Yeah, me too. I would like to to yeah, see too about their their plan. The huge undertaking to take over a, a a company with technology that's not your own. Exactly. Sure. Hello, everyone. Hey, Jordan. Hey, Jordan. Good evening. Hello, everyone. Hey, David. Hey, David. This is my first time using the electronic packets, so my eyes are going to be darting a lot more than usual. Yeah. And it is 6 p.m., so let's get rolling. Welcome, everyone. It is the 25th of January. Uh, welcome to the Lincolnville Selectmen's meeting. We are still operating under the state emer of emergency as declared by the governor. Uh, as sa such, we are subject to the Maine Freedom of Access Act and are conducting this proceeding on Zoom. And we encourage the public to participate uh, telephonically, video, electronic, or other similar means of remote participation. Send us an email, uh, a letter, um, or other common used methods of communication and we will try to accommodate you as best as we can. All action taken by the board will be done by roll call, including adjournment. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us at the town office. Uh, before we get going, Josh, would you care to read the quote of the evening? Sure. One of the greatest victories you can gain over someone is to beat him at politeness. Josh Billings. Yeah, I like that. Thank you very much. Uh, David, do we have anyone who wishes to participate in any non-agenda items in the Citizens Forum? We did not receive any by email, and I see none in the chat at the moment. Okay, wonderful. Well, not wonderful, but... Fair enough. Uh, if there's nothing there for any non-agenda items, let's move along to the administrator's report, please. Uh, just a reminder for folks viewing that uh, dog licenses all expired at the end of December and should be renewed before the end of this month. The online um, site where you can do that. You can do it here at the town office too, but the online site run by the state of Maine uh, supposedly be shut down at the end of this week, um, just so people know. Um, also, I have corresponded with Susan Corbett from the National Digital Equity Center, and she is willing and able to attend your meeting on the 8th of February. So we're all set there. That's all I have. Okay, that's great, thank you. Uh, if there's nothing further on that, let's move along to upcoming meetings and announcements. All meetings are conducted remotely unless announced otherwise. The Wage and Personnel Policy Board meets Tuesday, January 26, 6 p.m. Lakes and Ponds Committee meets Tuesday, January 26, 7 p.m. The Planning Board meeting that is listed on the agenda will not occur because they didn't have anything pending. However, the Midcoast Broadband Task Force is meeting on January 27th at 5 p.m. 
The school committee is scheduled to meet on Monday, February 1st, 6 p.m. Recreation Commission uh, tentatively scheduled for Thursday the 4th at 5.30, a site or remote to be determined, and the Board of Selectmen meets next on Monday, February 8th, 6 p.m. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions on that? Not seeing any, let's move along to any upcoming community events anyone wishes to share. Does anyone have any community events? David, anything? No. Okay. Let's move along then to the meeting minutes from the 11th of January. I move that the board approve the January 11th, 2021 meeting minutes as presented. Second. Moved by Selectman Late, seconded by Selectman Garrison. Is there any discussion? Seeing no discussion. Selectman Late, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Garrison, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Ray, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Barnett Parker, what's your vote? Yes. And Selectman Dunn, my vote is yes. The motion passes. Thank you. And rapidly moving along, uh, this will be a heads up for David to bring our chief over. We have our fire chief to give us an update on engine number five. Muted, Don. Welcome. Are you here? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Hi, Don. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Um, so we had an offer from the Matinicus Island Fire Department. Um, and I don't know if Dave forwarded you on the email that I got from their fire chief, but I mean, I'm basically here to, to see if you guys think it's a good idea to, to sell the fire truck to them for the sum of $5,000. Um, I looked into, like Laidley asked, is, is looked into trying to find a way to sell a fire truck in that manner. And the company that we're buying our fire truck presently said that there is a place online that's kind of like an auto trader. Mm. Um, but you basically deal with it yourself. They just take 2% of the total sale and we have to basically deal with the customers and or, you know potential people that want to buy it. Um, he hasn't gotten all that information to me yet. Um, uh, but speaking with him, he says it's pretty unlikely you're going to sell a fire truck that won't take in a sticker or an insurance company wouldn't insure anyway for any amount of money. Um, I don't, I mean, I, I think it might be a nice gesture just to sell the fire truck to Mechanicus for $5,000. I think we could probably sell it for a little bit more to somebody else, but um, I think it might be nice to see it go to a community that could really use it. Mm -hmm. um, I spoke with all of my other chiefs and they agree as well. So it's, you know, it's, I'd, I'd just like to hear what you all have to say about it. I mean, I have seen a, a, a brief, I think, a, a, I don't know if it was the whole thing or what from, from Gary Peabody from Matinicus, but he does realize that you guys are going to take off that truck what you feel you can reuse um, effectively. And uh, he is well aware of what is, is wrong with the truck. Yes. Yeah. I wrote him an email, you know, stating the, the tank cradle, you know, is going to need to be addressed at some time in the near future, whether it be two, three, four or five years, as well as the, the frame. He has also been in contact with Mike Ugly and they've talked in depth about it as well. Um, Cause Mike is the truck officer for that truck. So um, Mike could give him a good history on any other things that I could not remember. That might be a, you know, a problem in the future for them. Yeah. I mean, I, Chief, I think you articulated it really well. You know, it's a community that could need it, doesn't have a huge operating budget. And since they are a smaller, more concentrated community, it's not as though it's going to be traveling in the same way that it would be on the mainland. I, it seems like a really good fit. And, mm -hmm. you know, the trade-off of 
trying to beat the bushes to find someone to maybe offer us a little more versus the trade-off of spending the time to try to do that. I'd, I'd be so happy to see it going to a deserving community. Yeah, other I thought, agree. Yeah, other thoughts from the board? Uh, no, yeah, I, I agree with uh, what's been said so far. If it's only a little bit more, the, the time spent trying to get it to make it inspectable and get it inspected, it, that's, that's a lot of work. Somebody needs it, there are neighbors, I say go for it. Sell it to Matinicus. So Matinicus, um, do they have fire trucks currently? Yes, they do. They, I think they have two operational fire trucks. I think the, the, the one of the two, I think we donated to them oh, wow. seven, seven or 10 years ago. Okay. Um, which was an old truck. And then they, they just purchased a truck, uh, I believe six or eight months ago. Okay. And so uh, not being able to pass inspection on the mainland, I'm assuming on Botanicus, mm -hmm. uh, that's because they're, uh, that's okay. Be because of the, the structure of the, uh, of the government or the roads. I don't know I... much about Botanicus. <laughs> <laughs> Embarrassingly. Wow. I, I know very little as well. Uh, Gary said that it wouldn't be a problem with them over there at all, and it would be the nicest apparatus that they have. Okay. It didn't seem to be of any concern to them. I, I, I think that as long as they know, you know, we're, we're straight up with them and told them just exactly what's going on with it and why we can't, why we don't, we just can't keep it in service anymore. Um, I'm all in favor of of them having that vehicle, um, five thousand dollars is a is a very fair price, um, and I think it will serve them well. Um, and I certainly appreciate um, I appreciate him reaching out. Uh, I feel a little feel a little bad that we didn't reach out to them, but this is all still new to us too, taking it out of service. So I think it would be a good fit. Does someone want to make a motion, then, please? I move that the board authorize the sale of engine five in as is, where is condition to the Matinicus Island Fire Department for $5,000 and further authorize the town administrator to execute any necessary documents to affect the sale. I second that. Moved by Barnett Parker, seconded by Selectman Late. Is there further discussion? Seeing no discussion, Selectman Late, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Garrison, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Ray, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Barnett Parker, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Dunn, my vote is yes. The motion passes. Thank you so much, Chief, for um, facilitating this and getting back to us. Yes, no, you're very welcome. Thank you. Well, have a great evening. We'll turn you loose. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. You're welcome. And moving along and this is the cue david to bring our next guests over if we have them or were they told a later time there we go okay, okay. great um, by way of an introduction, uh, we have LCI uh, representatives here to chat with us about their recent projects in Lincolnville and their status and how it's going and any questions that may come up in the meantime. Uh, welcome. Hello, Alan. Hi, Alan. Hi, Alan. And Randall's on with us as well. Great. Well, the, the floor is yours if you would like to um, give the board an update. Uh, thank you for having us. And uh, I'm just going to I'm going to go ahead and walk through this presentation stuff. Uh, Randall can jump in at any time to go off mute and just anytime he wants to jump in and add value to this. That'd be great. So um, I did. I wasn't able to get you the materials in advance, but I am going to go if it's OK. Can I share screen or no? Yes. It Okay, let me see if I can do this. This is where I always, you know, waiting for disaster to occur. Oh, can you see that? 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow. Perfect. Hey, technology, great. <laughs> I'm going to put it on full and see if that'll work too. There, still there? Yes. Good. Okay, good. So I, uh, what I did is I put together just a little presentation to kind of walk you through where we are, uh, what's happened recently with the CARES Act, the Epidemic Broadband Bill that we've done in Lincolnville and, and also in Hope and Appleton, but we're going to be focusing on Lincolnville, of course. Give you a project overview, kind of show you the status of where we are as of this very day, and then talk about some next steps also going forward to uh, kind of moving all the way to a 100% fiber to the home community for Lincolnville as a result of where we are with this recent bill. And that's an actual picture of an actual little boy watching the actual fiber trucks going, our fiber trucks putting up fiber in that community. And I just love this. It's um, uh, to think about that kid's gonna grow up with a gigabit and think that's the, always the way it was. How cool is that? Yeah, that's where we wanna get to. So he's right out there in your neighborhood. All right. So real quick, just kind of going through some of the slides. Here's the overview, generally speaking, of the project itself. Uh, as you know, it was a project that was funded through uh, the Federal COVID Relief Act, the so-called CARES Act. Uh, that was that was those funds came to the state last year. Um, uh, they, the state received the COVID relief money, I think it was in, I don't know when it was, May, I guess, April, May. Um, and uh, they really never were able to kind of come together with what chunk of that was going to be used for broadband, uh, uh, for relief for broadband, for in particular for students and others. Uh, in the state, it took a long time for them to figure that out. Uh, in fact, it took some um, uh, encouragement, let's say, from uh, municipal leaders and school board leaders and uh, internet service providers like us to say, look, we got to get this money out there. It's there. They were kind of going to have to turn it back into the feds if they didn't use it. So what they did in early October, then they did put a program together that would allow uh, providers to come in and say, hey, I can provide uh, this kind of broadband relief for student and teacher households uh, in our area. And they, those applications were accepted and the deadline was October 15th. So after all of that, they finally got it done by October. So the projects were selected and the contracts were signed with Connect Maine Authority, which was gonna be the organization that in Maine that would administer this, this, these federal funds for broadband uh, uh, in Maine. And those um, contracts were signed on October 29th. So, the applications, I mean, it's a quick turnaround, which was good. The applications were received, uh, or rather our projects proposal was received on June 13th. The contracts were signed on October 29th. And that was a quick turnaround because, because of the federal project, everything had to, be, had to be substantially completed by December 30th of, the, of this year. So really they had to quickly turn that around so that we could get busy in actually starting to um, put that fiber up and getting those broadband, that broadband out to those unserved households. In Lincolnville, Hope, Appleton, and Bristol, those were the four towns that we had in our application. We ended up being selected to provide fiber, about 100 miles of fiber in all four of those towns combined, which would put us in front of another 325 student or teacher homes uh, in, in that 100 miles. Uh, of, as of the 30th, the, uh, we had 20, 250 eligible applicants, that it, applications that we'd received out of those 325, so that's about a 76.9% take rate, which is a pretty good take rate, all things considered. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, the project has to be substantially complete uh, by December 30th uh, of last uh, of 2020. And so that really only gave us two months to do this project. And there's always, a, I was never quite sure why they had December 30th instead of December 31st, but it was actually the 30th, is <laughs> what the federal government wanted. I wasn't quite sure of that. At any rate, so we had to get busy and get that part done. This project really was only, I wanna make sure people are clear, it was only for eligible student and teacher households. And eligible really means unserved student or teacher households. Those that, that were having, had access of less than 25 megabits uh, download and three megabits upload of broadband access at their home. So they had to be below, uh, at or below 25.3 to be considered eligible. And you must have a, 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 a K through 12 student in the household, a currently enrolled college student in the household, or a teacher in the household as well. So that was kind of the overview of what the size of the project was, um, how many student households there were in the 100 miles that we, were, we you know, received the grant money to work on, and what the eligibility criteria are. The next thing then I wanted to point out was quickly the kind of 
what was included in that process and what the LCI and time water added benefits that we added to that. I mean, one of the things that was included with the federal funds was that all of the build, the actual fiber build and broadband build, in this case, OK's fiber, fiber optic build, the installation, the equipment, and all of the labor costs, 100% of them were covered. Plus, uh, LCI and Lincolnville Telephone and Tidewater Telecom added that we would provide the first six of months of service free to those eligible student and teacher households. And we would also provide a 100 by 100 uh, megabit uh, service uh, for the first six months as well. Uh, the minimum that was required by the CARES Act was that it be a 50 by 10 um, megabits per second. So we, we wanted to start them off with 100 by 100. The marketing and outreach for this group, remember uh, I said there were about 325 student households that were identified. Those were identified initially by the school districts. Um, the five town school district uh, and also just, um, School district, uh, school union 69, right? That's your two out there. And then also AOS 93 in Bristol. And first I wanna stop there for just a second and say, um, there was about $12 million that was set aside out of that COVID money for broadband eventually. Finally, at the end of the, two, and at the, end of the year, they finally came up with that amount. There were approximately $5 million worth of actual projects that were put forward. Because the time frame was so short uh, they could, we could only run like $5 million out of the 12 million of projects that came forward. Of that $5 million of projects that came forward, 2.6 million of it was awarded to Lincolnville, Hope, Appleton, and Bristol. So we were successful in uh, really uh, really acquiring over half of that, those funds that were, uh, that were allotted, that were awarded rather, uh, for our students and teachers in our area. And that the reason I stopped there for a second is because the real credit has to be given to the school boards in this sense. Um, you have two dynamic, <laughs> great school superintendents out there. Um, when I picked up the phone, when 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 the when the guidelines happened at the beginning of just beginning of October, and everybody was kind of we were running around trying to figure out how could we possibly do this, they said, "Well, you got to have cooperation. You got to find out where these student households are." Uh, and that was the big that was the big that was the hardest uh, hurt the biggest hurdle was finding out where the unserved student households were. So literally, I picked up the phone and talked to your two school superintendents out there. And they immediately said, yeah, we'll do this. We'll, we'll work with you. And, and what we did was we came up with a creative way to identify those student households without jeopardizing any of the anonymity of student addresses. We sent them our database and said, here are all the addresses that we believe in Lincolnville, Hope, and Appleton are unserved, that are un below 25.3. You tell us who the students are, who the student households are, and they identified which ones they were. Don't tell us the addresses. We don't want to know that. That's, that's confidential. That's how we came up with that 325 uh, number of addresses. They then took on the responsibility of actually reaching out to those households. We didn't actually, we didn't send an email. We didn't market to them. We didn't mail to them. We didn't know who those addresses were. So, uh, and I have to say that this was the only area of the state that could, was able to quickly jump on that uh, and identify that and make that and reach out to those student households with the cooperation of the superintendents in the school district. So, um, that's really why we were successful in being able to get this grant, I think, is because of their um, willingness and, and ability to really uh, be nimble and make that happen. So uh, what those 700 offices did, uh, they did three separate email blasts out to all of those eligible addresses that they had identified over the course of the two months. We did one initially, then about another two or three weeks in, we sent another one, had them send another one out once again. We didn't have any of the emails, those were all going from the superintendent's office. And then finally, towards the end of December, we sent a third, we did a third email blast out to those who hadn't, who were identified as eligible addresses, but hadn't applied yet. Of course, there were also multiple uh, stories in the press and, and, and some media, good media coverage of what we were doing. So we were getting a lot of uh, information about it. A lot of people were inquiring about it. So that was good. And of course, the other big part of our success in kind of redoing the outreach and marketing was through the broadband committees in the town offices who were we uh, met with them uh, via Zoom and uh, a number of times, um, and they really did a good job of kind of reaching out and doing that promotion as well. And so that's part of why we were successful too in getting the folks we could get. Um, so here's how it ended up. With all of that activity going on, here's the data from Lincolnville. The fiber miles built as a result of uh, the, what we did there was an additional 14.5, 14 and a half miles of fiber, roughly. 
The cost per mile is, was right around $22,500 for that build. And that includes the fiber placement, the snaps, splicing, the central office equipment upgrades and the op and optic upgrades that we needed, the fiber drops, ONTs, routers, and all the other miscellaneous materials and labor. Uh, the eligible student and teacher households passed on that 14.5 miles with were 89 additional households that were identified as eligible teacher and student households. As of the 30th of December, we had applications, we'd received applications from 50 of those 89 eligible student households. Um, that's a take rate of about 56.2%. Um, and uh, the, as comparison, just for your information, Appleton had a take rate of about 58.8% and Hope had a whopping take rate of 95.8% uh, of their eligible student uh, households. So um, the other unserved households that we passed, remember doing 14 and a half miles, uh, and, and in addition to those 89 student and teacher households, where we are now, because of that additional build room, part of another 464 unserved households. That is to say, how other households, they don't have a student or a teacher in them, but they are also at 25, 25 by three or below. So that was one of the real benefits, of course, of having the federal funds to help us build out these teachers and students. It also helped us go in front of these other households so we can bring broadband, high speed broadband to more folks. Um, and I'll stop talking in a few minutes and let you ask questions. But the last part then is looking at what are the, what's left over to do, okay? So you, we did 14.5 miles. Uh, the big question is, okay, so how far are we now? How close are, is Lincolnville into becoming a 100% fiber to the home community? Well, we believe there are about eight miles remaining to be built. And that would put uh, those eight miles uh, would add about 93 more unserved homes would be passed as a result of that. I did provide, let me, pop up another document if I can. These, pop this up, got that for everybody? Okay. So this is the, what makes up that eight miles. Uh, our engineers then kind of looked at the map and I will show you the map because that's what everybody likes to see is the map in a minute. But these are the roads that we identified as saying, yep, these are the ones that we've identified that are unserved. Uh, they don't have, they don't have 25, three or above. Uh, and uh, that weren't covered in our CARES Act, largely because, frankly, we couldn't identify a student on those particular road segments. If I could identify a student, even if it wasn't in that original batch from the school district's office, if I could identify a college student or a private school student who lived there who was doing remote learning, we would have added it on, but we couldn't. So we could only do the ones where we could actually show where we had a student or teacher household. So these remaining um, roads, uh, eight miles were ones that we would think we'd like to say are there were ones that are left to be done so that Lincolnville can be a long distance fiber to my own community. And you can go through that and look at those and it's about 93 more homes in that eight miles. Um, what I want to do now is try, where did I get it? Try to bring up my, where's, how's that? Can you see my map? Yes? No. No? I'm not seeing a map. Uh-oh. Still looking at the spreadsheet. Hold on, I'm trying to I just go and step away. Right there. There we go. Sorry about that. How's that? Got a map? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. So what I, what I want to show you here is uh, let me take a couple things off and we'll try to see if the technology will work for me. Hopefully it'll work. All right. So there's the town. There's Lincolnville. So there's, you, know, you can see the borders of it. I hope you can make that out okay. The purple lines um, are your existing fiber that was in, was in uh, Lincolnville before we even did the CARES build. Okay. So as we've always said, you know, Lincolnville is one of those towns that is one of the mo has more most uh, most extensively built out in fiber in the state. So uh, you had quite a bit of fiber already in place. All of those and where all those purple lines are 
are uh, what we call loop fiber. So that means that anybody along those roads would be able to have uh, access to fiber to their home uh, or business in that area. Then with the CARES Act, we added on these red, red roads. So that's uh, within another 14 and a half miles. Those, that's what those red lines make up. So that puts us in front of more households. So as you can see, we're slowly building out the rest of what that remaining piece of uh, fiber for Lincolnville uh, would be. So then we look at the next piece uh, and that is the, uh, well, first of all, I wanna show you another thing before I do that. So before you go anywhere, excuse me, Alan, it looks to me like, uh, or is it fair to say that uh, the red overlays the purple and you might have rewired roads that already had fiber? Some of them did. I mean, some of them we actually had put more fiber on because we didn't have enough fiber for the, some of those roads where we already had fiber. But on the other parts, uh, we, we had to build along those same fiber lines to get to those other roads where there actually was no fiber at all. So it's the combination of both. But yeah, when you look at that, that's how it, it that's the total amount of all um, fiber that's available right now today in Lincoln, all of those lines, the purple plus the red. Um, then the last, I want to show you this too, then just to give you another frame of reference. You know, we think of Lincolnville, we're a Lincolnville telephone company. So you, so you think that, and we think that we uh, are the telephone company for all of Lincolnville. Well, we are for the most part. The blue line here shows you our, our exchange. That is to say where we are the telephone company. There's a part of Lincolnville where we're not the telephone company. You can see right down here and on the, on the route one section from you know, about 173 down to the Camden line. So you can see right there where we are inside of that blue line actually consolidated is the uh, incumbent local exchange carrier for that for that area so consolidated or formerly Fairpoint was is the uh, phone company there however because I can go up a little bit because in that area we have um, we are the cable TV provider we have a, a franchise agreement with the town so we have cable TV throughout that area we are already on all of those poles we've got pole uh, agreements so that we can be on those poles for our cable access for cable TV and because of that, we're able to overlash onto those, onto those poles in our strand there for, for more fiber in that area. The last, so the purple was already existing fiber we had in that area. This last piece down here at the very bottom end of that area before you go into Camden, that's where we added some more CARES, uh, using CARES funds to build up there because there were students who were living in that area that we could, that we could reach. So that's kind of the, the real huge high and lay of the land. We take the exchange off there so it doesn't confuse it. The last thing I'm going to show them, and these are the, well, let me one more thing I'll show you real quickly. Um, I think I'm going to try it. Oops, boom. Yeah, they're the students um, in various levels, um, the ones that we have applications for. So you get a sense of where they are located in your area. Also, uh, I'm going to scroll out a little bit. And you get, once again, if you can get a sense of, if you look at that three town area, Lincolnville, Hope, and Appleton, you get a kind of a sense of, uh, I'll tell you, we're kind of proud of this, frankly. Uh, you get a sense of all of the homes and that were impacted by this, um, by the ability for us to roll that out in two months. So you get a real sense of where those student households and teacher households are. The ones through five, those are, those are our kind of staging indications of what stage in the process they are in terms of application received, uh, whether the drops up, whether they've been installed, those kind of things. But that gives you a sense of that. Um, so we have a, quite a process of tracking those and making sure we know who's where and how we can get to them. The last thing then is that what's left. That is that piece, those miles I was just talking about, the other eight miles. So the white lines are those. Those are the ones that when we look at this, we believe that is what's kind of left to do um, in Lincolnville to make it what we would call 100% uh, fiber to the home community. Um, so those that, that other eight miles. Now, what do we mean by 100% fiber to the home community? What we mean by that is that you have access, everybody in town will have access to uh, broadband, high-speed broadband. Um, there are those, will it go down every individual road? The answer to that is no. Uh, the way we look at it is um, we want to have it on the main road so that anybody can have access to it. So that infrastructure is in place. The next part in is to say, uh, if there are side taps that are coming off, are there more than one? Usually it's three or two or three down in it on a side tap road. Uh, that we consider that to be a road that needs to be serviced. And again, back to that, it would be built in. Then there are the final ones that are roads that don't have that. There are roads that are off of a main fiber line 
but the Frank Tap Road does not have, you know, two or three or more households in that area, uh, on that road rather, sorry, I'm turn this off, um, that requires service. So we would say, nope, we're, we have access to you. We're in front of you. We're on the on the on the main road in front of you. That that then that homeowner then would have to pay for the rest of that process to bring fiber down to the rest of their road. A good example of that is like like we were talking about along the, the route one area. I mean, look at these roads. When we look at these, well, obviously we have fiber all along there. So that fiber backbone is there. That's loop fiber. Anybody who lives within 250 feet of that purple line can get it get fiber with it. Really, just paying for the install charge, a hundred dollar install fee. If you're not, if you're the only one down the end of the road, or if you're just one or two at the end of a road, one of those roads, really, and some of them are actually driveways, then we then that would be that homeowner's responsibility to pay for that last part. So we tend to we look at it that way when in all of the communities we do. Um, just to give you an example, the latest um, uh, connecting grant that we got for the town of Bremen, which is allowing us then to do the full build out of Bremen the rest of this year, which would make Bremen a 100% fiber to the home community. There are about 400 new addresses that we were building out to. Uh, building our fiber would make, uh, our, our build would make fiber accessible to. Of those 400, there are about 50 addresses that would have to have some additional aid to construction charges, we call it, for that homeowner to get fiber to their home. So 350 would we would build out to. They would only have to pay the regular installation charge. The other 50 out there would, would require some type of additional charge. Okay, so that gives you the overview of that part. Um, and I'll leave that up, but I also want to kind of go to the next steps and just say, bring that back up. Is my, get that back up, everybody? Next steps, we look at that. There's eight miles to do. We think there are about 93 more answers to do. And there's a lot, a lot of decisions that have to be made there. We'll make sure we're in agreement on what those miles are, who's covered, who's not. The next steps in our mind. Alan, we're still on the Google map. Oh, sorry. All right. Can can we can we stop for just a minute, sure. Alan? Uh, you mentioned that there was none run on Moody Mountain Road because there were no identified families on that road. And then, as we go along with your presentation, you say unless there's two families, then it, there's going to be an expense to the family. Moody Mountain Road. Where, so there was none on Moody Mountain Road. I know for a fact that there are two families with children on Moody Mountain Road. Now, I don't know how that got missed for identifying that there were children. Um, one is about, uh, geez, probably half a mile up on the right-hand side. The other one almost is at the end where Moody Mountain Road intersects High Street. What's gonna happen with that, um, with that type of thing? Or maybe this is, there's some missing information there. I mean, I don't know. Um, but what's gonna happen with something like that? When I, when we, this is the map back up now. Make sure everybody's looking at, at the same. I thing. mean, at whose expense is that going to happen? I cannot fathom that these children weren't identified in uh, in the school system because I know both the families have got kids in the school system. So um, I'm just my my question is an overall of obviously there are some families that have been missed, or at least in my mind they have, because this indicates that there are two families on Moody Mountain Road that have been missed. So what's going to happen with that type of situation? Uh, we're at on Moody Mountain Road. What's that? Where are they at on Moody Mountain Road? I guess I'm well, sure. like I said, the first one starting at Route 235, where Moody Mountain Road intersects Route 235, if you go up about a quarter to half of a mile on the right-hand side, uh, there's a family by the name of Shouty slash Wheaton, um, then if you keep going about another two, two and a half miles as a new farmhouse on the left-hand side, Justin Blake, um, both of those families have kids in the Lincolnville school system. So, mm -hmm. you know, unless they've moved out of town in the last year and, and I don't know about it, but I'm local and I've seen them. So I'm just wondering what's going to happen when this is all said and done at whose expense are these people going to get um, fiber? I guess I got when I'm looking at, at maybe I don't, I'm not familiar enough with it. I'm looking at Moody Mountain Road from 235 heading north, right? Um, yeah. So that, is there fiber on Moody? You, you said there wasn't any fiber on Moody Mountain Road. So that's why I'm asking the question. So is there fiber on Moody Mountain Road all oh, yeah. the way to yeah. High Street? All the way up to, uh, is that up to Martin Corner Road? Oh, Martin, Martin Points Road. So there is that part between High Street 
and and uh, Martin Point Road. I think that's the part, the segment. Okay. Of okay. Mountain. Then one of those. So that's houses, where the students are. Is that where the students okay, are? Okay. Then one of those houses can be served, but the other one can't be. So the one is on that segment, and one isn't. Is that right? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Correct. Yeah. We did Well, if it was on that segment, we would have seen it from. The, we didn't see it most, apparently from the school board or on the original. Okay. Original okay. Wheel. That's possible. Uh, we certainly don't have an application from the, Otherwise, we would, would show that application on the, there. The second the house been, would be ident uh, directly across from Moody Mountain, uh, from Moody Pond. You can, they're right directly across from Moody Pond. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, just, no. I'm just wondering what's going to yeah. happen if there have been houses that have been that haven't been identified. Um, and in this case, you know, I, there are houses on on Moody Mountain Road that that need the the fiber. I would have thought we could have, you know, mm -hmm. I. Hey. There's one there that can't be. Yeah, you're pieces. circling it right there. Yeah, that makes one yeah that's the house right there. Maybe it was missed. If so, we can look at that. But also, um, there was only so much money to be spent. We were able to do that. We built it out to the extent we could. That's why we're trying to identify the end of those roads. Like, for example, this next white piece, which we yep. say is that, that's a piece that needs to be built. Uh, that's part of what we're looking at is for that next phase, then, too. How do we build that? Securing funding to build out the rest of those pieces, those white pieces. Maybe you do uh, I suppose it's possible. Was it missed one, or there was one that was only that we didn't notice the school district had on there that we didn't have on? Well, certainly, we certainly don't have an application from them yet. Um, but um, our our thinking then is going forward is to say the next steps are to uh, really look for how we secure funding to build those, and that's part of what we were talking about. And, looking at the next round of grant funding for the Connect Main Authority, which is starting uh, really next month. Okay. So our point was to say, yep, we want to do that. We think there's eight miles left to do. That's in our judgment uh, from just kind of that higher level engineering look at this thing. The next step would be to say, now we would like to look at those eight miles, do a build design for those things, engineer design for those things, and say, yep, here's what it's going to cost. I can still get that out. Still on, you're still on the map. Did I bring up my final? No, we're good. We're good. I I appreciate it. I just it I just saw it and I didn't want to forget it. That's all. So the next step for us then really is to be able to say, yep, we want to start to work with the town. Uh, at the end of this month, or uh, actually this week, the Connect uh, Connect Main Board meeting is uh, having their their January meeting and the final January meeting where they will actually. Uh, act on they make the final rules for the eligibility and the criteria and uh, and, the, and the scoring for the next round of uh, infrastructure grants. Then they will make those applications available to uh, towns and, and, and municipalities and uh, internet service providers that want to bid on uh, submit a grant application uh, in February and March. Um, so we would like to think that that's something we'd want to talk to the town of uh, the Lincolnville about in terms of can we work together to make an application for this remaining eight miles uh, first of all and, and also working in detail to find out have we identified all those miles that are there what else is left to do make sure we're in agreement on that make application together uh, as we've done with other communities and as we've done in the past with Lincolnville to um, for uh, connect main grant uh, if that were the case and we're successful at receiving that we hopefully then would be able to uh, the contract would we, it'd be make the application in March. The awards would be made and contracts signed probably by May 1st. The Way Connect main grants work. It's a 12 month grant period and a 12 month application, a 12 month grant period. So you really, from the time you get the grant and when the application is signed, it's 12 months that those, all of those uh, uh, households have to be served. So that would be our target if we did that. So that's, I just bring that up to say that's an answer to the question what's next? How do we do that? Uh, that's something that, uh, and we're going to be approaching the other community as well, Hope and Appleton and probably Bristol as well to say, we think this is a, a logical way for the Connect Main Authority to use that new funding they have to then leverage the federal funds that were already brought in to get to a fully 100% fiber at the home communities in all of those four towns. I'd like to ask a question if that's right. Sure. Uh, yeah, just to go along with the same vein as Selectman Late. Um, so I know we keep reading and hearing about 100% access and, you know, uh, fiber to the home, but that really is just on, on the main roads and not the hookup to the houses, correct? But because each homeowner is responsible for that. It's just like anything else. When we build it and we're, we have the fiber there, 
uh, and of course, apply for it so they have access to it. And then first, they pay a $100 installation fee. Um, and the CARES grants were separate. They were all paid for 100%. Yeah, yeah, I'm just curious because I know that, um, I know you had also mentioned how many houses needed to be on a road to make it a viable connection. I'm just curious, do you guys keep a record of the applications that come in to get connected to that service? Do you have any idea um, or do you have an idea of how difficult or not that um, process may be for current customers of LCI? Sure, we've received applications all along for years, obviously, in all of our areas, and we look at each one on an individual basis. If we build out and we get fiber on a frontage road, on an access road, on the main road for an area, that, that when a person applies, if they're within that area, the, um, the first uh, the application is $100. The first 250 feet of drop wire from the, the main line to the home is included in that, in that $100, uh, $100 um, application fee. Beyond that, they pay a dollar per foot for aerial. So if you're 500 feet from the line, the first 250 feet is included, you'd pay a dollar per foot extra for the next 250 feet. It's yeah, I understand the logistics of the price. Oh, sorry. Okay, I meant more the actual, the literal accessibility to the service. I understand the pricing. I'm looking mm -hmm. at more of, um, you know, um, how long does it usually take? Would you think it's abnormal for, let's say, a road that has five people who are all willing to pay for the service and installation on a road that already has fiber? Is it abnormal for that to take more than a year, more than two years? Is it normal for them to have to apply more than three or four times? Um, is it something that's truly accessible and easy to hook up to? Um, once again, each one of those cases is handled on a case by case basis. And some people have been in the process for several years trying to get fiber to their home or a certain road to a community. Wait, and the, and so not with the capital that we have. So that's why we try to look for these other grant opportunities to help us get there to leverage our capital along with homeowners and towns as well. I know, Randall, go ahead. Oh, I don't understand the point he's trying to make. Um, thing is, is that if the fiber is available and they're in line to get hooked up, it, you know, we charge one hundred dollars to get a connection. It costs us twelve hundred dollars close to it to connect that customer up. Um, if there are five people on the street and we built that street, the fiber is going to be right in front of them, and the access to the fiber and the equipment is the key thing. And we built a lot of fiber, a lot of equipment in Lincolnville just recently with this CARES Act. Um, so, um, like you saw some overbuilds of fiber um, with the red um, over the purple, that was needed because there was not enough fiber on the road to feed the customers, the, the amount of customers on that road. Um, so there was some overbuild and we had to add a, lot, add a lot of equipment into our office to take care of those uh, several, several hundred students. Um, so there's a lot of uh, uh, things that uh, besides just fiber on a road that account for uh, getting somebody connected. Now, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to achieve is having fiber in front of as many customers as I can with a, um, within a 250 foot length part of the $100 install. Um, there will be conditions in places that are people are a thousand feet off the road or have buried wire without conduit. There's a lot of different things that uh, um, matter when we go to hook somebody up. And we had a backlog of customers right now waiting to be hooked up. Um, just, you know, regular easy ones to hook up, um, including the students. And it takes time. We're a small company. We're trying to do what we can. Uh, what I think we've achieved here is incredible. And it's nobody nobody in the state has done what we've done, especially in Lincoln. Jordan, just maybe I'll ask it in a different way, just so I understand what you were trying to ask mm -hmm. um, either Alan or Randall. Uh, what's, the, what's the average wait time once someone's application is put into LCI if there are no extenuating circumstances? Let's say they're within the 250 feet there's fiber there, you know, what's what's the, the window for a hookup? I think we're looking from around right now because of the backlog, a month, a month and a half. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's only because there's such a backlog. Yeah. Okay. But one of the other, I will say too, I, we understand too that uh, 
I've been, I've been a lot of town meetings, a lot of these towns, I talk to town managers and broadband committees all the time. And I know that they've wanted this four years ago. They wanted it two years ago. They wanted it yesterday. We understand that. And we're, we have been building out as quickly as we understand uh, as the capital was available. We've been building out, I guess, we seem to be attracting to this thing too. capitalizing on the federal funds that were available and aggressively getting pushing those out to the Appleton, Hope, and Lincolnville and Bristol. We think now there's a great opportunity to capitalize even further with it and to finish it off, uh, connect the new funds to over the next year to really to really build out the room at those remaining miles. And so that's something I know that a lot of community have been waiting for, especially in the longer loads. But so this is one of those areas that might be a, an opportunity for that. Yeah, Kern, you have a question. Yeah, with with the opportunity of this upcoming grant, would there be a chance to build into your request? some assistance to help with the backlog and get this uh, actually, when, when, we, when someone says to me finished, I, I take that as being able to walk into a house and have a connection. Um, so maybe that's a different conversation on your end, but what I'm asking is, is there a chance to have that on your, you know, on your work order as part of something that can be achieved through the grant uh, to help with the backlog and to help achieve 100% connectivity for each town. I mean, it's, it's great to have the fiber run to the driveway, but what fosters the, the frustration with uh, present and, and upcoming customers uh, is the fact that they've got to wait a month and a half, maybe two months um, for uh, connectivity. So I'm just wondering if that can be built into your criteria for the next upcoming grant, or is that something that's not even going to be a consideration? Well, right now, um, we've already considered that, and we have contractors working right now um, that we're trying to get up to speed, um, and they're doing part of the part of the install for the students, and um, it's taken a while to get them going. We brought them in probably, what, in the beginning of December? Alan, mm -hmm. uh, the three uh, guys in Lincolnville right now that are doing certain parts of each order for the students. And um, we're trying to see how you know, quickly they can get things done. And we're working with them, trying to train them. Um, they, they already have fiber experience, but they don't have fiber to the home experience because nobody else does it in the state. Um, and so um, this area, in the, um, in the mid coast is one of the few areas that have fiber to the home. And um, so we're, we're trying to bring people in to help us get caught up. We're hoping we can bring them up to speed. Um, and I'm hoping if they prove themselves to us that we can keep them on to help the backlog. That's all been part of my plan, but I gotta make sure they're producing because um, our, we got a few guys that work for us, you know, uh, five or six people in our outside plant and about two or three of them are really good at what they do. And they're one of the few people in the state that can do complete fiber to the home builds, right inside to the jack work, turn up the equipment. There's a lot to a fiber connection compared to an old copper connection. And, but once you get it, you're getting the, the best product out there. Um, so yeah, we're, we're working on that and they have to prove themselves these, these contract just says that they can do this. And I'm working with them um, every week to make sure they're getting the, the correct training. And uh, we wanna make sure when they do it, they do it right. Um, and we're hoping that these people can help us with that backlog um, if they can get up to speed. And uh, it takes a while. You just can't learn this stuff overnight. And, um, but doing what we've done here and getting fiber in front of these houses that's gonna change the backlog experience once we get caught up. But remember, we took on 300, or it's gotta be 200 and something students um, that we have to connect in a certain period of time. Um, and that's, that's huge for a company like us to accomplish. Not to mention we have that, the Bremen job we're building for Connect Main we got last year. Um, that's gonna be several other connections we have to do. Um, so there's a lot for us on the install side, but by getting this fiber out in front of these homes and getting the equipment in the office that can handle it is huge. And uh, the work that these people did in the last two months 
is there's nobody in the state has done this. Nobody would have took it on. We were sitting right to do it. And uh, these guys did an incredible job. And I can't let that you know go without being noticed because I know it's not to everybody's house, but uh, we don't even know who wants it, first of all. So it's hard to build everybody's house. Even the students, not all of them took it. Um, not all of them applied. Um, so um, we're, we're doing the best we can and by far better than anybody else surrounding us, by far. I worked for Verizon, 9X, and right next to you, Northport, Searsmont, all those areas, um, they don't have fiber at the home. They don't have fiber in front of their house. What we've done here is incredible. And uh, you gotta really look at the, the work that was put into this. It's, it's been a great job. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Although it may not be the answer that a lot of people wanted to hear, I think it's important to get it out there that it's going to take a while to make the connection um, and, you know, that you're actually training the people as you go. So thank you very much. I appreciate that. You, you probably see them on around there. They have on target um, trucks. Um, yep. Yeah, I do. Other questions from the board? Yeah, Jordan. Yeah, I have a few. I'm trying to just space them out so that I can evenly give out time. But um, I guess I was not clear with what I was saying before is that um, I have found and we've heard a lot of stories that it's very difficult to get service, fiber service, even when you are on a main road 250 feet away. So that's I was trying to garner whether that was something that was going to change. But um, I want to touch on something that Alan had brought up um, that was much to my surprise that actually made me really happy was that he mentioned the gigabit service. Um, and I really wanted to ask about our current infrastructure and whether it was true fiber, if it was copper over fiber, and if it was capable of delivering symmetrical gigabit service or not. Um, because I know at the moment, I was also surprised to see that the CARES Act recipients were receiving a symmetrical 100 megabit service where for subscribers, a, a symmetrical service is not available. So. I was just curious about all that um, and whether or not this system could handle that type of uh, service or it will be able to in the near future. I, it will be in the near future. I, I, we're, we're building a backbone. There, there's three pieces to a, a, a fiber network, one from the pole into the house, and then there's the middle mile. And the middle mile goes back to the central office and back to, to a connection that goes to the internet. And that's the third piece. Our internet connection is by far um, um, capable of handling everything we have. We're not even touching what, what it can do. We've been working for the last two years and brought on some uh, technical people to help us build up our middle mile. And Lincolnville was one of the first places we uh, um, looked at in, uh, I think it was Lincolnville Center. They changed some equipment over so it could handle way more than um, the original equipment. The original equipment was a calyx gear we put in years and years ago that could do fiber to the prem, um, but we're using it for other stuff also. And we, um, when we originally did um, our fiber to the prem, we put in some more modern stuff um, for a Connect Main grant we did in Lincolnville. And then now there's new equipment we've installed beyond that that's even better. So our middle mile was the biggest worry is not just um, once you put that fiber from the pole to the house um, and it can give some pretty incredible stuff, but you want to make sure your backhaul is good. And the backhaul that we've built here is much better than it was before. And that's why you probably saw some overbuilds on existing um, fiber. Um, we wanted to make sure we had clear paths and, and all of it is fiber. Everything from the house out to our uh, central office to, to the internet is fiber connection. So why is there asymmetrical service and when can we expect to have the option to have a connection that is a symmetrical and 150 megabits and above? Um, because as you know, in the last couple of years, sped up by the pandemic, we've seen the drastic increase in the need of upload speed where it was not necessarily true before. Uh, there's a lot of live video streaming. So when, when do you think that we'll see something like, um, you know, something that's just a, a regular type of seed rather than just above the minimum of 25 and not symmetrical? Well, we, we have uh, our two feeds normally are 50 and 100. And it's 100 by 20 and 50 by 10. That's quite a bit above 25 and 3. 
Um, but um, 100, uh, 100 by 100 and 50 by 50 is available at a price. Um, and so, yeah, it's available now at a price. And um, more than those uh, 100 by 20 and 150 by 10. But, uh, we, you know, the way we're looking at our network is uh, there, it's way above what the state's asking for. And um, we're, we want to make sure when we do offer gigabit connections, it, it will be um, um, pure uh, fiber gigabit connections. And uh, I, I don't want to jump into something um, just because somebody wants me to. I want to make sure it works right. And uh, there's nobody else in the state doing that. Um, so if you can find me somebody, let me know. They might be doing gigabit to uh, the hospitals or the banks or, or something like that. Um, but uh, I don't think Northport or uh, um, Belfast or uh, CSMont or none of them are doing uh, a gigabit connection. I think uh, we're one of the leaders in the state and we're trying to do the best we can. Well, I'm more really, I mean, I, I appreciate it and all the things that you guys have accomplished, but I'm, I'm trying to get some concrete answers out of you guys so that we can know what to expect okay. moving forward, especially if you would like for us to acquire grant money on your behalf. Um, so these questions are important. Um, and when we're talking about accessible internet, I can tell you we've been trying for years and put in multiple applications and we're right off the road and we have several people signed up and I know many, many, many people are trying to. So it's frustrating for me to see all of this line that's laid and to be told it's accessible. But at the same time, I know for a fact it's absolutely not accessible. Um, and so I'm trying to see moving forward, since you guys seem to be very busy and maybe spread a little thin since you're going in at building in many communities, what your concerns for our community's needs are. Um, and I haven't heard anything specific rather than really talking points. Yes, I'm not sure. You know, um, we have we have a certain amount of equipment in our central offices that can feed a certain amount of customers that we paid for and that some of the grants uh, paid for. Okay, that's not a, not probably not enough to feed everybody in Lincolnville. Um, but uh, so it does cost money as we build out. Um, and I think we've done quite well in Lincolnville, and I think. Um, a high percentage of Lincolnville will be able to get access. And I, I'm not sure, you know, if you understood the, the dynamics of building the network, um, and you're welcome to come down and sit and look at what we're doing um, at any time. And uh, we're, we're trying to do the best we can. Um, but uh, you're asking for perfection? Because uh, uh, um, we're doing, you know, I think, what we've done is, is, is quite incredible. And even before that, I mean, we, we brought fiber to Lincolnville when nobody else did to certain points where we did get grants and uh, where we could get uh, money to do it. I mean, we've also built out fiber on our own uh, for our cable TV company just to get our cable TV notes back. And that we put it from the customers then. So we try to take advantage of any situation we can. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not going to be able to please everybody all the time. And I think we, uh, Lincolnville's on one of the largest percentages that we could. I don't know if I have any more concrete than that. Alan, you got something you want to say about that? I just want to just say, um, I don't know if the others or other select members are having the same, uh, same questions that Gordon has. But uh, what I would say to that is, I, clearly, as I've mentioned, I know I've been with the company four years. I haven't been here 15 years, 20 years, like a lot of our folks have. But I've been here four years now. And even in that four years, I know that there's been pent up demand and frustration about why can't, I've got five people down this road. Why can't you build this road? And the truth is we can only do so much. We're a small company, we had capital, we had to spread it out, we had to do what we could. We had to prioritize where we could. Now we can. I don't understand. Right now, this is the opportunity that I think we've all been looking for to go ahead and say, let's now finish this off. Uh, there have been areas that haven't been, we haven't been able to as quickly as we would like to. Now we have the opportunity to finish those out. The, the uh, Federal Cares Act and the funds for that is a significant, significant boost to that, not only in Lincolnville, but especially in Pokemon, Pokemon in particular. Uh, so 
we, we are we're excited about it. We want to do exactly, I think, what you're talking about, uh, Jordan, in terms of finishing that job. Looking backwards for the last 10 years, I know there's a lot of frustration. I know that, okay? But looking back at that and saying, well, why can't you go back and fix that 10 years ago? I can't, I can fix it going forward. That's what we're trying to do. We're here at, for poised to do that. We want to do that with the town. I, I guess that's where I'm coming from. We got a choice. I guess my frustration is, is that I'm with you on that, and my attempt is actually to garner information in which to move forward. However, the problem I've had is that you guys are not giving me any information or answering my questions. Um, and they've been very specific about technical ability and delivery speeds, and, and I don't know. I, I, I don't mean to put you guys on a defensive foot, but I mean, you are here, and you're asking for our help to acquire grants to help you build out your private profitable business. And I'm asking about the access to your product. And you claim that we're, host, we're close to 100% of the households being accessible. And you keep saying fiber to the home, fiber to the home. But there are hundreds of homes in Lincolnville who cannot get your company to come out and even give them an estimate on bringing internet to their house, regardless of where it is. So that's what makes me nervous. And I haven't heard any information from you guys about your specific plans for the future. Jordan, with all due respect, we just showed you our map. That's our map. That's where our fiber is. It's right there. It, it is fiber to the home. We can provide fiber to the home all along where that map is. Clearly there are some that are farther off the road to live along down a long road that they may have to have some customer has to pay for some of that, but we can do that within the limitations of our ability to get there. However, it's there and symmetrical speeds are there. So those are two questions you've asked. I, I know we'll, we'll get it, we can answer it more specifically if you'd like. The issue though is we're prepared to do the rest of it now. I don't, I guess I'm not, I guess I'm not understanding the, the question exactly. Um, I understand the previous frustration, but and frustration with us not answering, what else can we tell you? I'll show you our map, I'll show you our map. Randall, our engineer, can tell you exactly what we well, do, when you can expect to get a gigabit at your house, and kind of stuff. Well, the the things that I wanted to hear, like I said, are specific, not guarantees, but and not vague generalizations. But how long it really takes to get your service? When can we expect higher speeds that are symmetrical that meets today's needs? And you haven't answered them. Do you have a plan to have a service that's 250 symmetrical? When can we expect 500 symmetrical? When can we expect a gigabit? When can we expect these homes to have access to your fiber to the home network? These are things that customers need to know. Well, once again, we haven't, I mean, if I can jump in on that too, I can jump in. we haven't really been, our customers that have been approaching us, they have been asking about when can you get fiber to my house? My, I can't be on DSL anymore. Let's just call, let's call it what it is. DSL does not work. It works. It, it met that need at the time. That doesn't meet the need. How can you, you're our telephone company. Those are your telephone poles. When can you get fiber to us? Now we're doing it. We're there. They've not been asking us, Jordan, when can you get me 200 by 200? When can I get a gig? When you've been asking us that, there's a small group that asked that perhaps. Can we get symmetrical? The answer is yes. Did everybody hear that tonight? That's yes now. You can get 50 by 50 if you can, if you within reason, if you're on one of those lines or 100 by 100 right now. So then we you know we can do. And that's a significant over DSL. Jordan, that's a significant bump. That's a, I, I, I'm looking towards the future, not on making the slightest bit improvement on the worst possible service. We're trying to build something for the future and, and the needs are growing exponentially. I mean, you're in this industry, you must know that. You must know that there's an increased need for symmetrical bandwidth, correct? So looking forward and, and planning forward, we need something that's not the minimum now we need something that is going to help support our needs going forward 10 or 15 years. And so what I'm saying is, is that if we're going to help you acquire, acquire public funds, taxpayer money, to help you be a more profitable business, I'd like to know what your specific plans for servicing our town are. And I don't think that's unreasonable. More specific than what we just said. Um... So you specifically want to know when you're going to get 
certain speed levels at each individual house. And when you can realistically ins ins install to people's homes, realistically, and if you're having problems, you can say it will take six months. Well, we're installing in Lincoln every day now. Okay. I'm telling you that in the field, on the ground, that that is not the reality of the situation. And it's, I'm sorry that this isn't an open dialogue. I would love to be able to help you guys build things out quickly. I would love nothing else than to be able to snap a finger, get you guys the money and have you build out. But the problem is, is that you keep repeating fiber to the home and they, it's not to the home. It's to the main roads and it's left up to homeowners and which I understand. And I want you guys to make a profit. I don't begrudge anyone for making money. It costs what it costs. But what happens when hundreds of citizens in Lincolnville can't even pay whatever amount to get you to look out and consider attaching in your home? How, how can you address that? Well, we're addressing it. We're addressing it by charging them hundred dollars for an install, and it costs us twelve hundred. I mean, that is yeah. not the case, though. I'm saying this is what I'm telling you: is that that is not available to people, and I'm not even going to get into the pricing because that's a whole other discussion. I'm not, I'm talking about pure availability to install your service to the home. I'm telling you that's not how it works. And people call multiple times and apply multiple times and there's no record kept. And it doesn't matter how many people or how much upfront money. It's not about the $100 installation fee or how much you're putting up. We can't get your service at our homes. It doesn't matter if we're off 52, if we're by the town office. This is what I'm saying. And so I, I don't know how you can refute the facts of that situation. And that's not true. That's how we can refute that fact. We built out in this previous year, we built out many, many roads in, in and get and fiber to the home uh, all along throughout throughout Lincoln. Have we done everyone that wants it all at the same time? No, we just can't do it all at the same time. If there is if we can make the business case for a road, we can do that. Obviously, now with the federal grant monies and also state monies, because they have fit, the Connect Main funds have changed, as you know. This year, this past year, they passed a bond for $15 million. That's gonna make more funds available. That way we'll be able to do it faster. That way we can take on more of that stuff. That's it's what we've been waiting for. It's what broadband communities have been waiting for. And now it's here. It wasn't there five years ago. It wasn't there last year. It's here now. That's why we wanna work with Lincolnville to finish it out. I mean, I, I'm sorry, but I don't know how to say it any differently. Randall, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. I'm, Sorry. All right. I, I think, Jordan, you've clearly made your point and your position. Is there anyone else on the board that wishes to ask a question or a, a comment? I'm not seeing anybody jumping up and down. David, do you have anything to ask or contribute? No. Fair enough. Can <laughs> I ask a question? Yes, absolutely. Please do. I, I probably shouldn't do this, but I'm going to because I just can. Uh, so are the other board members feeling the same? Do they have the same feeling that uh, Jordan has expressed? I mean, I, I was, I don't know. I just try to get a sense of the board, whether it's what they feel. So I, uh, I, I can answer that. Uh, <laughs> through my own personal experience, I've been very frustrated um, over the years with the DSL service, you know, with, with, uh, the 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 uh, uh, internet service finally got um, finally got fiber um, a significant amount of problems with that. My experience tells me that the customer service model at uh, Lincolnville Telephone Company needs um, some help. Uh, right from the office staff that answers the phone right to carry through for work order completion. Um, I don't know how I could say that any more respectfully, but I think that's what Jordan is trying to convey. Um, now I'm in good shape, but I'm only one person out of a couple thousand people here in this town. But it was actually forced by my wife's um, employer uh, to prove that what we were being told wasn't exactly what was going on. So 
it's just a bit of frustration. He's trying to get some answers uh, for the townspeople of when it's going to happen. And I think probably a better way to ask it, I don't want to put, you know, words in your mouth or any, anything, but with this, uh, with all of this build out, is there consideration for customer service expansion and or education? That's all. I, I, I feel that that's, that's what the underlying thing is here. Maybe I'm completely wrong. Um, but follow through means a lot, especially to customers who are going to be long time customers. Yeah, and I, I, I would like to echo uh, what Kern said. I mean, certainly, um, I found customer service challenging. I feel fortunate in how our application for an installation of fiber went. Um, we actually had no idea that fiber ran in front of our our home, um, but it was sort of a kind of by accident that we found out that it was an availability to us. And once we found that out, made the call, started the ball rolling, it felt relatively um, painless and, and reasonably quick to get connected. But anecdotally from the community, I certainly have heard um, stories not unlike the frustration that Jordan has attempted to articulate uh, Kern's experience. Um, so, you know, that being said, um, I can't, you know, we also as a board are not in a position to uh, dictate your terms of service as a private company. You know, you're, you're doing us a, a service here and coming here and offering, you know, a status update of what your company is doing within our community. And so I, um, I certainly understand and respect that. And so I'm, I'm not, you know, this, I, I certainly don't want this to be an airing of grievances for a private corporation that's doing business in Lincolnville. Um, but are there some elements to be uh, left to be desired? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah, Josh. Uh, first off, thank you for coming. Uh, we appreciate having this update, the, the CARES Act. I mean, to expand to this many students in Lincolnville, not just Lincolnville, but in the neighboring towns is, is incredible, you know, and, and to have that capital uh, so your company can deploy it so quickly. Uh, it's certainly appreciated. Um, I just want to say as a, something that could be helpful, I just shared a link to the Lincolnville Broadband Committee uh, report um, that we finished, uh, I think, was it? It's December now, um, oh, last month. Um, and uh, we asked, we asked three, three open-ended questions at the end, which was, uh, if, uh, if you have access to, to fiber from LCI, um, but, but you chose not to, um, to, to go through with it, uh, why? And, and then we ask uh, a few more things, just open-ended questions about their overall broadband service. So I think it, it might be helpful just to look through the report. We kept every response in there because uh, just thought it would be helpful just to see it unedited, the good and the bad on, 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 on people's opinions on, on their broadband experience in Lincolnville. Um, and just, you know, my, this one anecdote, my, my experience getting uh, fiber was, was very positive. You know, that was back in 2000, uh, 2015 and, and my, uh, I'm on Van Cycle Road. My house is, it, the run was, I guess, probably under a hundred feet and uh, it was seamless and paid a hundred dollars. So, um, you know, if, if the run is within that 200 feet, it, it, uh, it seems like people have a, it, it, it's, 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 it can be easy and seamless, but we certainly had a lot of, uh, responses in the survey of people just talking about how they were quoted a price of thousands of dollars to, to run fiber. Now, I don't know how long their driveways are. Maybe the driveways are you know, as you said, it's a dollar a foot. 
uh, beyond 250 feet. Um, so, but anyways, just saying, uh, read the report if you can, it could be helpful. Mike, anything to contribute, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> No, the only spot that I was on was trying to find the unmute button. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, no, uh, I want to thank both of you folks for coming in and giving us the update. Yeah, I too have a, a, a couple um, questions about uh, your long-term plans going forward, providing uh, some magical service, for example, and what should the town work with you to facilitate connect connect main grant, for example, uh, would we be negotiating with you? That is, would we be at the table saying, "Well, perhaps the town of Lincolnville could use um, better access to telehealth, for example," and uh, or could uh, there be some changes to customer service that the community could help you with? Blah blah blah. You know, and so I'd like to know if 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 if, if that would be on uh, a possibility if we would be working as partners more or less. Um, and uh, the second thing I would say, and, but, but that's, that's, that, that's long-term stuff, I understand. And, uh, but the second thing I'd say anecdotally, um, I'm, I'm pleased with DSL. I think I'm the only person in Lincolnville who's happy with DSL apparently, um, but it works for us. And, but we're only, you know, a half mile from uh, the north of the splitter on 52. So there you go. Just real quick answer, one qu answer to that question about the partnership part and working with towns. The answer to that is yes. Uh, Bremen is an example of that. They have a very active broadband committee, as do you, uh, and their uh, select board empowered them to work with us. Uh, we, um, we a lot of the cussing and discussing went on there, negotiating and about who's gonna do what, how much, where the towns are, where the unserved is, how far we would go. That's part of what we're looking for in that partnership for a couple of reasons. One, it helps us make a better choice. Two, it makes sure that the town gets involved and people can say, oh, I see that this is happening and they have a voice in it. Uh, but then also, uh, uh, there are things that we didn't know. There were things that they wanted in terms of more hot spots for their area. There's things that they wanted in terms of, uh, they were the ones who brought up, can we, what kind of um, subsidized service can we have for low, low, fam low income families, those kinds of things. Those are the things we want to have an involvement with. That's where working with the town and especially the broadband committee, and eventually the select boards that helps us it makes us make a better a better application package it's we were much more successful in getting connect main grants when we do it that way that would be our goal okay great well, uh, well uh, thanks uh anything else from the board gentlemen we really appreciate you taking the time out of your evening to come and speak with us and, and um, give us this really exciting update. I know from the time that uh, your contract was finalized with um, this last absolute whirlwind of work that you've been um, accomplishing it. I've been very much looking forward to this evening. So thank you. And I, um, am anticipatory of future conversations with you. Uh, as you know, the connect main piece is coming up the next round. So that's something we just wanted to, that's another reason why we were glad to be invited to do this. We want to make sure that that's up. Let's talk about it. See if it's a, something that we can do together. That would be great. Thank you. We'll, we will be chatting with you in the future. Good. Good. Thanks so much. Appreciate the time. Thank you both. Thank you, Randall. Thank, Thank you. you. Randall, Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And while Alan extracts his computer from our views, let's move along to uh, a revised escrow agreement that we have from the Harbor Ridge uh, subdivision. David, would you care to give a bit of a preamble here? Sure. <clears throat> Let me just square away this last one if I can. And left by himself. Um, the board had previously back in October 
approved an escrow agreement with uh, Stephen and, and Margaret Case regarding the uh, surface pavement for the Harbor Ridge subdivision. Um, and then winter came along or fall came along a little quickly than anybody anticipated and they did not get the paving down uh, the base course before um, weather caught them. And so Steve approached me about um, uh, what could be done and actually ended up going back to the planning board because this all starts with the planning board and their recommendation to um, be allowed to amend the escrow agreement so that they could actually sell lots prior to, um, there he is, prior to any paving at all and come back and say, can we pave the first course next year and then uh, do the base course by the regular schedule that we previously agreed. So the planning board said it was all right by them. If it was all right with you, um, a new escrow agreement was drafted, which uh, Steve has a copy of, and now you do too. Does the board have any questions for the applicant who has kindly joined us this evening? Hello. Hi. Yeah, I, have, I just was wondering, the amount of money that's in the escrow, would that fully cover the totality of the paving project? Yes, and uh, it's actually extra because they put a, uh, they put an extra amount on there for possible uh, price hikes in those few years. Right, so, thank you. What we've done uh, is to, uh, Steve actually provided us a copy of his estimate of quote from his paving company. Um, we're also quite capable of figuring out how much pavement needs to be down on a road in terms of thickness and length and uh, densities. Uh, so we did our own calculation and then um, we were comfortable with the initial agreement. And then with the fact that Steve came back, we looked at possible inflation over the next four years for the surface course and added in a little extra contingency into that last agreement. Probably disappointment but yeah yeah it gives me a little bit more incentive to get it done faster <laughs> are there any other questions uh for mr peace or if there aren't i will entertain a motion i move that the board authorized lately done as chair of the board of selectmen to sign the revised escrow agreement between stephen case margaret case and the inhabitants of the town of Lincolnville for the placement of the pavement in the Harbor Ridge subdivision and that the town administrator be authorized at the escrow agent. Second. Moved by Selectman Gerritsen, seconded Thank by so Arnett Parker. Is there discussion? Seeing no discussion, Selectman Late, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Gerritsen, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Ray? Yes. Selectman Barnett Parker? Yes. Okay, done. The vote is yes. The motion passes. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I just get in touch with David. Uh... Yeah, if you could come in and uh, sign that, Steve, and bring us a check, we'll get it all working. So uh, do you need what a personal check do or you want a cashier's check to do that or what? Um, what does it call for in the agreement? Anything specific? Uh, not that I know. Just... No, yeah, via certified check, it does. There you go. That's what we need. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll take care of it. Great, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Have a great evening. Yeah, Have a good night, Steve. Yep. Yeah, bye. Nice. Good night. Thanks. And it is thankfully that time of year where our road commissioner has requested that we post the roads for the inevitable thaw that will be happening and then the freezing again and then the thawing again <laughs> david anything to add <laughs> uh the only thing i would add is in the past our orange posters that everybody sees gets posted along the roads um used to have spots for a majority of the selectmen to sign the new ones now um delegate 
or allow for you to delegate that to a, I don't remember what it said, authorized official or something to that effect. So if you want to adjust the motion to just allow the road commissioner to authorize and sign those and see he's in the best interest of the town, he can sign them, save you folks from signing them on or using the signature stamps, which Mike and Jordan don't know anything about. That seems reasonable. Any objections from the board on making that amendment? No. All right, then I will entertain a motion. Well, I move that uh, the Board of Selectmen authorize the road commissioner to post the roads for weight limits as he deems to be in the best interest of the town and further that the board authorizes the road commissioner to use his signature. So moved by Second. Ray, seconded by Selectman Garrison. Uh, Second. Any, any, I did, I did, sorry, was it, was it not? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was me by like a millisecond. Okay, great. Um, I just look for the yellow. Difference yeah. in bandwidth. <laughs> there you go. Uh, if there is no discussion, seeing no discussion, Selectman Late, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Garrison? Yes. Selectman Ray? Yes. Selectman Barnett Parker? Yes. None, my vote is yes. The motion passes. Thank you. And I will hand this over to David shortly. We have a discussion regarding the existing uh, and uh, proposed amendments to the conservation easement restrictions on the Crystal Mountain Land Trust Parkland, soon to be our parkland. Um, David, would you care to expand on this? Sure, and I think, and I'll check in just a half a second that Heather Rogers from Coastal Mountains Land Trust tuned in as a yep. attendee as well. Um, the existing, we're, we're slowly plotting ahead with the uh, behind the scenes work for the um, transfer or exchange of lands uh, with Coastal Mountains Land Trust. Um, the um, title search work has apparently just been completed and the conservation easement's been sitting in our laps or in the lap of the town attorney for a little bit of time. And now that other things are getting done, um, this has risen to the top of her pile. Um, the existing property has a conservation easement over it or on it, depending on how you properly say that, uh, which you all have a copy of, which uh, was originally drafted back um, when NBNA or Corporate Property Services Inc. owned the property. And Coastal Mountains Land Trust was the holder of the conservation easement. Um, obviously, Corporate Property Services Inc. was not a public entity, uh, it was a private entity. And with the transfer of ownership coming to the town, it was suggested that the uh, conservation easement be amended to reflect that um, change and to add, uh, add different restrictions and allow for other uses still within the spirit or confines of the original, but to more accurately reflect, reflect public ownership. So Coastal Mountains uh, attorney prepared an amended and restated easement, which you have a copy of. The covenants and restrictions are somewhat different, again, reflecting um, municipal ownership. And the town attorney wanted to make sure that there wasn't anything that was egregious or that this group didn't want to agree to. Um, so you have a copy and certainly if there is something you wish to have legal counsel on regarding that or have a conversation with the attorney, um, either in public or executive session that can be arranged at some point in the future. And now I will stop and I'm going to bring Heather over if that meets with the board's pleasure. That sounds good. And she's done.
Welcome, Heather. Got nothing. Almost. Is she here or is she waiting? There you are. Welcome. I don't think we can hear you, even though it says you're unmuted. Yeah. Yeah, your audio isn't. Uh, if you go to the lower left, you can reroute where your microphone comes from. And maybe it's not. Maybe it's choosing something else. Can we kick her off and bring her back again? Would that work? Oh, David, you're muted. Oh. I can probably send her back to being an attendee and then try again, if anybody thinks that works. Yeah, let's try that. The virtual reset button. <laughs> virtual reset. OK, let's see. Boom. Having the power is just. Whoops, now I've lost the participants. Oh, now she's, she's somewhere in no man's land. <laughs> no. Probably on village soup somewhere. In the east there. <laughs> oh, there she is. Hang on, I'll bring her back. What's interesting is her box is just a gray box right now, like it was when she first joined. And I've never seen that before. Mm. Oh. I see her name. So maybe I'm a little bit ahead of. Still, uh, yeah, still totally gray right now. There she is. Oh, and there it is. There we go. Hey. There you are. Can't hear you. Still can't hear you. Yeah. No. Darn. Sorry. <laughs> you just write it on a sheet of paper and hold it up. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. Can we try one more thing? Heather, sure. uh, could you quit your Zoom program and then start it again and come back? Mm, meeting. I'll try that. While we stumble through um, technology, is there anything that jumped out at anyone uh, or do you wish to hold your questions for Heather? I think I had a basic question that maybe David would be able to answer. Um, but so in the, you know, in the, uh, document we're holder and so in essence what they're doing is we have so we have no ownership over the property we're in a way stewards of it that get to use it but that the that the grantor is responsible for all the upkeep the that portion of it was a little bit unclear to me yeah so oops, yeah so we'll be the owner of the property and if you can imagine this Coastal Mountains Land Trust as the holder of the conservation easement actually has overlapping 
jurisdiction to a certain extent to anything that we've agreed to allow. Mm -hmm. For example, if I find something in here that says uh, on under covenants and restrictions, no commercial, industrial, residential pouring or mining activities are permitted on the protected property. So if all of a sudden we discovered a uh, gold mine there, the town could not without their permission and maybe not even with their permission i don't know i'd have to read the rest of this um we wouldn't have the ability to open up a gold mine because we've we've given that up with the conservation easement as had the previous owners of that property so the key at this juncture as i see it is the things that are listed in the amended and restated agreement. Okay, I'm gonna to try to bring Heather back. Um, uh, starting at the bottom of page two, where it talks about covenants and restrictions. Mm -hmm. That's what limits what the town can actually do with the property. Mm -hmm. And some of it requires us to do certain things um, to the property. For example, under vegetation management, we're required yeah. to submit a plan for their review and approval every five years. Um, those are things where it's part of the part of the exchange. Okay. Thank but you, they David. can't they can't take the property back, obviously. No, what they can do though is this is an agreement where if we don't live up to what we say we're going to do, they first would say, hey, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. And if we still, you know, thumb our nose, then they go to, you know, your honor and say, your honor, the town agreed to this when they took ownership and we are asking you to compel the town to do it. And, you know, your own attorney, before you got to that point would be like, uh, you agreed to all these things when you took on the ownership of the property. So you're going to lose in court. So you better do it. Hmm. Hi there, are you? Can you hear me now? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> well done. Away. So welcome. Oh, technology. Yes. Yeah. Thanks oh, for yeah. having me. Do you, have, do you have anything you wish to um, say to the board before questions come at you? Um, I mostly just wanted to be here in case there were questions um, that I can answer and I will try my best. Um, the goal, I think David pretty much summed it up well, but um, the easement has been there for since MBNA granted it to a, to the land trust and our goal in amending it was to make it um, reflect public ownership because the ownership from a corporation was a little wonky the way it reads um, and to secure public access for, um, for the parcel. And also most of the, I would say like the majority of the other amendments were to try to make your management a little easier. Um, we were like to allow for more commercial, like um, de minimis commercial uses to like expand on that a little bit. So we were trying to simplify things was our goal in amending it. But, um, you know, I'm happy to answer any specific questions if you have them for me. And certainly recognizing you're not an attorney. <laughs> <laughs> I am not an attorney. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so questions for Heather. Well, I'm not, I'm not an attorney either. Therefore, I could say it looks great. Uh, <laughs> if I were an attorney, I might say something differently, I, but I don't know. No, it looks, it looks good to me. It makes sense. The only question I would have, I guess, um, would you, uh, for, let's say, recreational purposes, would the, uh, we would need your uh, permission, consent and agreement to what we would allow on that, right? It would, it would be a joint... Uh, Coastal Mountains would have to okay any recreational use above and beyond what we are what we are already planning. Is that correct? Um, I mean, I think as long as it falls in what is allowed, like I think yeah. there's a pretty broad allowance for 
public access there already. Right, there is, but I was thinking of specific yeah. things like you have, I mean, I abut coastal land uh, out here and uh, you know, there's uh, no wheeled no wheeled vehicles in, this, in that particular section, right? Okay, uh, uh, do you have a blanket policy that you would apply, would apply to this, pro this property to keep, to prevent, let's say ATV use? or whatever we wheeled vehicles that we could think of. Yeah, we have policies on our preserves. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you have a preserve or an yeah. we hold, but on some of the land that we own, like the Duck Trap River Preserve, mm -hmm. um, we have certain policies for those preserves where people are allowed to do some things and not others. Like, sure wheeled vehicles, but then people are allowed to hunt or right. you know, cross country ski or hike or whatever. Um, in this case, we would really, our only role on the property would be to uh, monitor the conservation easement and make sure those um, terms were followed. Um, okay. Other decisions in terms of what re recreation you allow, as long as it doesn't violate the terms of the easement, we would mm. not need to have a role okay. in approving or disapproving of that. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, I just had a question regarding the structures um, as it seems that they, they're they under this agreement yeah. and how that relates to the overall tenor of the agreement that suggests that anything we do should be towards a net conservation gain. And so we haven't set any policy with regards to how we manage the property, but there have been a lot of different ideas bandied about and some of them have been perhaps removing some of the structures or, you know, and again, none of this is set in stone. And so um, there really was nothing that spoke towards removal or um changing the structures just in sort of maintaining them as they are and so i'm just i'm just wondering if you have any um uh i don't know any, anything to offer with regards to that um if i can look briefly but i think that removing a structure, I would not see why there would be any difficulty with that. I think it's more, um, I think it's probably not mentioned because it's allowed. <laughs> um, but if you wanted to make sure that was, you know, I don't want to waste, I can sit and read it, but um, I um, don't want to waste your time. So I would say that removal of structures would certainly be something that would be allowed. If you wanted to maintain them, I think that that would um, certainly be allowed. There are not a lot of it, but it says existing structures may be maintained, improved, and replaced with substantially similar structures in I, you know, substantially the same location. Um, so I think, and everything that is there now will be documented um, on like a survey and with pictures that, that we will prepare. Um, so I would think if you in the future wanted to replace them, if you remove them, I believe that would still be allowed. Okay. And then my second question is sort of along those same lines because there we will essentially inherit some landscaping that has not been maintained and is in various stages of wilding itself um, and how the vegetation management plan, I'm just thinking, you know, putting it that in place and how um, it could drastically change in year zero to five, say the first right. management right. plan. And, and if you, have any thoughts in, or suggestions to us with regards to that? Um, yeah, I think that, that we would expect that. I think the reason we wanted, we, our attorney put the vegetation management plan was to try and actually simplify communication with you guys. The original easement uh, would have required 
uh, approval from us and a state agency to use any pesticides or things like that. And so we thought if you guys, if the town could do um, a management plan, a vegetation management plan, and that can be as simple as like a letter once a year that just says, these are our goals for the property that, um, you know, as long as they're within the terms of the easement, that would really be all that would be needed. And typically if landowners aren't changing their plan, we don't need one every year. So it could just be, if your plans change drastically, you could write another letter. Does that makes okay. sense. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, other questions for Heather? No, looks good to me. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. Karen, nothing? I got nothing here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it, it, looks, it good. looks good. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I feel like it actually uh, got my wheels turning in a good direction too for some of the policy that we'll have to set in the future. So it's it's really quite helpful. So thank you. Oh, great. I'm glad. Glad to be helpful. David, anything coming to mind that you think we didn't ask and should? I'm just listening and learning. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, Heather, we can set you free into your evening and uh, we appreciate you popping in. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank Have you. a good night, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Thank you too, Heather. Yeah. Uh, does anyone on the board feel that they would benefit from or would need to have us um, secure some time from our town attorney to counsel the board further on this document? Beyond. I don't think so. All right, Karen, I missed I missed what you said. Unless somebody's got something that's really sticking out that's that just doesn't make any sense. I this looks pretty straightforward. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I I would I would agree. I think uh, there's no need to get the attorney involved with with us for this document. Maybe yeah. down the road when we come up with policy change for for use for that. <laughs> But I don't see it now. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Great. Perfect. Good. I do I do think it's likely that when all of this um, title search and conservation easement gets reworked and the deeds and all that other paperwork gets assembled, that um, we might want to have at least a huddle or a memo from the town attorney saying you're all set or, you know, just a chance to ask the questions might come up with all of this at once. Um, I was a little not, not concerned about doing this piecemeal. It's kind of hard to do when you get a 10 page document of uh, legalese. We just want to make sure that nothing was jumping off the page at anybody now because obviously it's easier to address now than it is two days before a closing mm -hmm. yeah for sure and, yeah. and getting this all all at once would certainly be a daunting task to review for sure okay great well if there's nothing further on that then we can move along in our agenda to and david will put you in the hot seat again to give us um a rundown of your uh, the seminar that you attended for Efficiency Maine uh, regarding munis small municipality retrofits. Yeah, so I was very fortunate. Uh, I was unaware of this grant opportunity until a notice arrived in the mail one day before the last possible informational uh, webinar to attend. But Efficiency Maine has a program for small municipalities uh, that they um, will be accepting applications through the end of March for energy efficiency, uh, primarily uh, converting uh, lighting to LEDs and heating systems to heat pumps. And we had the, our energy team or committee um, look through a number of our structures and lightings and heatings earlier 
probably two years ago now and uh, made some recommendations. Obviously, the street lights at the beach or the sidewalk lighting at the beach, not street lights, but the sidewalk lighting at the beach, we converted to LEDs. We've done uh, conversions at the sand salt building um, to LED lightings. The town office, um, when they did the um, renovations here, went with the, they're not all LEDs, but some are but they're certainly a high performing, um, whatever energy saving light structures at the time, they didn't make any recommendations for here. Uh, the fire station, um, the center fire station's in pretty good um, spots, situationally, I believe. The things that they had recommended um, um, and yeah, so, um, where was I going with this? So we have right now, we have some identified lighting challenges uh, at the pier. Those were converted to LEDs and have been repaired and repaired and repaired. I'm not sure that um, even if we apply for that program for the um, conversion that we're actually going to save any electricity costs. I think the lights and the wiring there is just uh, run its course, but I think it's worth looking into. The other that has come up for discussion is the beach fire station has a pretty antiquated um, uh, hot air furnace there that's oil fired. Uh, that a conversation came up once ago about uh, perhaps doing a uh, heat pump there and with a grant um, and the fact that um, we are currently generating and paying for more electricity from our solar array than we're using. In essence, the fuel for that would be already paid for or inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed like it would be a good time to um, potentially apply. So I wanted to bring this to the board's attention and just get some concurrence before I push other things aside to work on this too, uh, because there is a deadline coming up for the application. Uh, again, it's sometime at the end of March. The other thing that's a little bit of a kicker um, is you need to have your money in hand, which um, for if the pier, if we can make that work there, we do have some harbor savings money that could be used. And we have specifically set aside some money in the building repair fund for heating systems or roofing um, that our share of what might come down for the fire station uh, could be accessed by the Board of Selectmen. So that's kind of where I was and wanted to see what you all are thinking about that. Yeah, Gordon. Oh, I think it's, I think it's great. I just had a question about the, um, just the BTU replacement of the heat pumps versus the oil furnace. Do you think you'd be looking at like a split stack, you know, that you'd need more than one register to, to make up the difference or I'm not sure. Um, what I would do is contact the uh, folks from Efficiency Maine have a Audit. list of pre-qualified people. Um, and I would contact um, pre-qualified people and say, what do you recommend? It, in all likelihood, we're going to need to maintain the um, oil furnace if for no other reason for a backup. Um, but I think we could appropriately size um, the heat pump unit for the beach fire station. It's, it's in essence a uh, garage and a half in size. It's not the best insulated building. It is something that we're looking. Um, we have a piece of property on the beach road that at some point we may be looking to replace the station there or move the station there. Um, if nothing else, I think point if we were to look to dispose of the beach fire station, any prospective purchaser would be much happier to have a heat pump in it than they would be to have an oil fired furnace. 
Any other questions from the board? No. I just want to say that, that I think this is a it's a great idea. I mean, we're we're giving CMP free electricity right now and not getting compensated, so we might as well harness that. Great. Yeah, certainly. Right. And and fixing the lights down at the harbor too. I mean, we've been kind of making it work for so long, and if this is an opportunity that we can take advantage of, that's great. And thank you, David, very much for. Uh, taking the time and bringing this to us. Um, I'll entertain a motion if someone would care to make one. I move that the, oh, go ahead, Karen. Go ahead, buddy. You're all set. <laughs> I'm so sorry. All right, the, I move that the board authorize the town administrator to apply for Efficiency Maine Small Municipality Retrofit Program and for any necessary town match at the Beach Fire Station the funds be authorized from the building repair fund and any necessary town match at the pier be authorized from the harbor savings account. Second. Moved by Jordan, seconded by Mike. Uh, any discussion? Seeing no discussion. Uh, Selectman Late, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Gerritsen? Yes. Selectman Ray? Yes. Selectman Barnett Parker? Yes. I've been done. My vote is yes. The motion passes. Thank you all. And moving rapidly along to selectman updates. Kern, what do you have for us? Well, we did finally get in our Midco Solid Waste uh, Board of Directors meeting, um, approved our budget, and also approved the facility that we'll be taking our trash to. Um, I gotta, I gotta say, I'm enjoying being with that group. Uh, we're getting things done, um, and I'm really enjoying um, the um, organization of our new manager. Um, he is uh, doing a very good job. That's great. Thank you, Selectman Garrett. And any updates for us? Uh, just the only one is I'm really looking forward to the first uh, broadband task force meeting that I'll be attending on Wednesday. Um, but other than that, that's that's it. Super, thank you. Selectman Ray. Oh, just a couple things real quickly. Josh, uh, will that broadband uh, task force meeting be televised? Uh, will, uh, will, 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 we be, will we be able to watch it on YouTube, for example? Do you, do you, do you know? I do not know. I have a Zoom link, uh, but I, don't, I haven't clicked through the email. I, I hope so, but I'm not actually okay. sure. Okay. I think Chair, Chair Hall seemed to indicate that she welcomed viewers. So I bet you if you yeah. send a reminder to our town administrator, he'll he'll help connect the dots. <laughs> okay, I, I might have to do that. Yeah. And the second thing I just wanted to uh, mention that um, the uh, uh, the woodshed thing that we've got going, um, they expected to pick up uh, traffic to pick up uh, substantially um, for the rest of the season. And so uh, if anybody here is willing to sp give a couple hours on Saturday, we may need more than one person down there. If you're interested, give me a call. And uh, I find out by 6 p.m. on Friday how many people are coming by. And so far, it's just one person, myself, can handle it easily. But we may be getting five or six in the morning or something like that. Okay. Thank That's you. all. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Barnett Parker. Any updates for us? No update here. Okay, and so we done. I have no updates, so thank you all. And we have the treasurer and payroll warrants to approve and sign. Can I have a motion, please? I move that the board approve the treasurer's and payroll warrants. Second. Moved by Selectman Ray, seconded by Selectman Barnett Parker. Is there any discussion? Discussion, Selectman Late, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Gerritsen? Yes. Selectman Ray? Yes. Selectman Barnett Parker? Yes. We've done, my vote is yes, the motion passes. Is there any other business that the town needs to discuss? Seeing nothing, I will entertain a final motion. Move to adjourn. Second. second. We all second that. Moved by Selectman Late, seconded by Selectman Gerritsen. Is there any discussion? Seeing no. I just, I just want to say one thing. 
I want to say thank you to you all. I know whatever. I just feel very welcomed onto the board. And I just wanted to thank you all very much for how you support yourselves and how you've welcomed me into the group. So thank you very much. Well, well, well welcome. Yeah. Well, shucks. <laughs> um, that's a nice, nice note to leave yeah. uh, the meeting with. So with that, Selectman Late, what's your vote? Yes. Selectman Garrison. Yes. Selectman Ray. Yes. Selectman Barnett Parker. Yes. And my vote is yes. The motion passes. We are adjourned. Good night, all. And I didn't even have a good night. David. Good night, everybody.